Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast as I now want to dive into what has been an incredible start to the season for the Minnesota Vikings. Could not ask for anything else up to this point. Seemed like this was an offseason that was headed in a very tough direction. Now, I love Kevin O'Connell, and I do think that, again, there is a good infrastructure there, but you talk about sort of sort of some of the off-the-field stuff with you know Jordan Addison getting arrested, J.J. McCarthy tearing his ACL, unfortunately, of course, the passing of one of their draft picks as well, that I do feel like this is a situation where, you know, the Vikings could have come into this year with, you know, bad vibes and just sort of fallen by the wayside. But I think that it almost is even more of a credit to Sam Darnold, who even if all of the other surrounding factors are not going well, Sam Darnold, somebody who has that energy and that fire to go out and get it is so important and crucial to the entire team as a whole. And, you know, there's another situation in Carolina there that we're going to talk about in a bit where I think you can make a little bit of a similar case. But Sam Darnold in a situation where he understands this is probably, you know, if it doesn't go well, his last chance to prove himself as a starting quarterback in the NFL. And he has been phenomenal up to this point in the season. And, you know, you look at three games here, completing 68% of his passes, 657 yards, eight touchdowns to two interceptions. And it has been really incredible to see this rejuvenation from him. And, you know, there's parts of his game in particular, like you look at the mobility and elusiveness from him in the pocket, the way that, I mean, the first touchdown of this game against the Texans was him being able to avoid players, scramble out to his left, and then find Justin Jefferson in the end zone that, you know, you're seeing a lot of really good pocket presence from him. This is, by the way, the same Sam Darnold that, while mic'd up on Monday Night Football, said that he was seeing ghosts. Like, that same guy is now, you know, being able to properly navigate a pocket, sense pressure when it's coming, and make the adjustments necessary to do so. He has been... Nothing short of excellent up to this point, at least, you know, relative to expectations is really the the caveat there. <clears throat> it's not like he's looked, to me at least, like the best quarterback in the league, but he is fulfilling his role as well as anybody else in the league is at this point. And he ends up with this game, 181 yards and four touchdowns. Looked great there, but I do feel like there's a couple different things here, and I want to circle back to Darnold to sort of cap things off here, but I also have to give love to the remainder of the team as well because I think that that it has just shown to be such a well-run you know, organization, and specifically just the functions under Kevin O'Connell have been so great for them up to this point where you end up going and getting an Aaron Jones at a discount who's been excellent for them up to this point in this game. 19 carries, 102 yards, adds another 46 yards in the air with a touchdown there. That That's somebody, again, when you talk about instilling belief and ha- inserting that fire in a situation where it seems like nobody really, I mean, they are the nobody believes in us team up to this point. And to be fair, I'm still, I still don't totally know if I believe in them in terms of being a playoff team, but I've been thrilled with what I've seen up to this point. And then you also have, of course, the star power of Justin Jefferson, that offensive line. is one of the best units in the league. And additionally, defensive side of the ball, I mean, this front office as well, they went out and they spent on defense during this offseason, bringing in a Blake Cashman, an Andrew Van Ginkle, and a Jonathan Grenard. Grenard, by the way, he had revenge on his mind. He definitely had that fire going up against his former team in the Houston Texans, where he went out and recorded three sacks in this game against his former team. I mean, just excellent stuff from him and this defense as a whole. I think that Brian Flores deserves a ton of credit as well. Now, the Texans were without their top two running backs in uh, Joe Mixon and with Damian Pierce, but it's still a talented team. And C.J. Stroud has looked, you know, just so composed up to this point in his career. 
and they forced him into two interceptions, which is the second time of his career up to this point that he has thrown multiple interceptions in a game. They were getting pressure on him all game long. It seems like Flores was pressing the right buttons in terms of when to bring pressure. Obviously, very blitz heavy, but now he also has more faith in the remainder of his defense to be able to settle in as well. That you still have, you know, veterans in the secondary, and this is overall again. I'm just blown away with the 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 results we've seen up to this point, and I think it is an entire team effort. Now, again, I guess very quickly here on the Texans, like I mentioned, they were shorthanded in this game, and that's definitely part of the reason, but. They just kind of got all outclassed, like top to bottom here. And CJ Stroud, again, I have, you know, the utmost faith in him moving forward, but we saw him rattled in this game. We saw him, you know, making some bad decisions. I don't blame the first interception really on him at all. It was tipped at the line of scrimmage and popped up into the hands of it, uh, one of the linebackers. So, you know, I think that ultimately nothing that you need to fully panic about, but you know, uh, a game that they should be able to bounce back from, but even being a little bit shorthanded to be able to stick it to the Texans like this. And the Texans were in the game for a while. And the Texans, I will add this as well with them, you know, just been way too messy up to this point in the season where you look at Laramie Tunsil, their star left tackle, one of the highest paid tackles in the NFL. He ends up picking up five penalties in this game. That's just, you know, really unacceptable, but I'm sure they know that. I'm sure they will be able to bounce back from this, but you're talking about back-to-back games with at least 11 penalties for the Texans, so that is maybe of slight concern. But sort of circling back here to the Vikings that, you know, I think that when you ultimately look at sort of how this all shakes out for them, we know the NFC North is a very tough division with the Packers and the Lions really being the main two. Now, I had expectations for the Bears coming into the season, and we'll probably dive a little bit more in depth into Caleb Williams and that game later in the week here. But that being said as well, you know, I I think that they are, have shown flashes of being able to be better than the field, the product they're currently putting out there on the field, but they're not ready yet. And that is almost going to be a little bit more of a window that is open for them moving forward. And they're going to start their divisional play this upcoming week on the road in Lambeau, still TBD on whether or not Jordan love is actually going to play think it's possible the Packers have sort of alluded that he could be in these past couple weeks but ultimately you know I had no faith that he was going to be able to play in either of these last two games the initial timeline that Ian Rappaport put out there was about three weeks headed into uh coming out of that season opening game so this would be around there and you know versus Jordan Love in Lambeau would be the real test for them, I think. But again, I said that this upcoming weekend against the Texans was going to be a test too. So it would be disingenuous of me to sort of just keep kicking the can down the road. Now, that being said, I'm not going to sit here because of these three games and now fully say the Vikings are Super Bowl contenders and that they are, you know, set for the future. But really what I think the importance of all of this is, is that, Kevin O'Connell is running such a well-coached system. Brian Flores is, I I think that he's an excellent coach and he's continued to show that every time he's gotten a chance as a defensive coordinator. Now with all of the Tua news and sort of that situation, I don't know if this is the offseason that he's going to be able to get another head coaching opportunity. He might be interviewed in one or two places and... I think that that momentum is going to start to build up. But I feel like that means, you know, a great sign, especially if Flores does hang around for at least another year. And it's going to be a great sign for once J.J. McCarthy is in town long term. And, you know, I've had people in my life ask me about the idea of, well, do the Vikings just stick it out with Darnold for here? If you can get come to a mutually agreed upon deal where maybe it's a one, two year deal for Darnold 
and have him continue to be the bridge into next season, it's in play. Um, it would require Darnold, by the way, in this hypothetical to continue to be playing at the level that he is throughout the rest of the year. So again, TBD there, but I, I feel like Darnold is probably going to play his way into getting a contract somewhere else. There are a couple other teams where they, you know, are going to be in need of a quarterback. The two teams that really stand out to me that could potentially, you know, look into spending. I think the number one destination would be the Titans um, because Will Levis, I have a very hard time believing that he's going to continue to be a starting quarterback in the NFL all that much longer. You could maybe throw the Raiders in there, but they also gave Gardner Minshew a two-year deal, so... I'm not totally sure there. I mean, Carolina is a team, obviously, that is going to be in need of a quarterback, but I don't think that Darnold is going to go there. So, again, it's way too early in the season right now to be talking free agency and where he could end up. But, you know, I think that Darnold could potentially come back to Minnesota. Minnesota is in a very good place moving forward here, and they have to feel good about where they currently stand, both in the standings today and in the vision of what they are long term. Because ultimately, if they make a run towards the playoffs this year, that will be great for building a culture. I don't think that anybody is seriously going to be picking them to come out of the NFC. That's never what this season was about. That just continue to build momentum. That's all you can really ask for for the Vikings at this point. You're playing with house money a little bit, and you just got to try and continue to build off of that, which I think they are very capable of doing so based off of where they're currently at. But I did just mention the name of the Carolina Panthers, and they are in a situation where you don't feel good about their infrastructure whatsoever, really, but you do feel really good about what... Andy Dalton was able to show and in turn maybe feel a little bit better about just how bad the roster situation there is in Carolina. So I want to dive into that because I think it is a fascinating conversation of Andy Dalton coming in and lighting the NFL on fire in his first game in replacement, of course, as well of Bryce Young. So we're going to be diving into that, but before we do so, we have to take a quick break. Do not go anywhere and we will be right back. 